All right, well, it's um, deja vu. Uh, we've heard this before regarding the ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas. It's the same story. Israel has presented a ceasefire agreement. It's an Israeli ceasefire agreement. <laughs> and it's just up to Hamas to agree to it. Here's Antony Blinken saying exactly this after his meeting with Netanyahu today. Watch this. Uh, in a very constructive meeting with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu today, uh, he confirmed to me that Israel accepts the bridging proposal. Uh, that he supports it. It's now incumbent on Hamas to do the same. And then the parties, with the help of the, the mediators, the United States, Egypt and Qatar, uh, have to come together and complete the process of reaching clear understandings about how they'll implement the commitments that they've made under this agreement. But the next important step is for Hamas to say yes, and then in the coming days, for all of the expert negotiators to get together to work on uh, clear understandings on impl implementing the agreement. Okay, so first of all, it's not an actual ceasefire agreement. Um, it is a bridging agreement, whatever that is. So they're calling it a bridge. It's just a bridge. We're not at a ceasefire yet, but this is kind of the bridge to get to the ceasefire agreement. Um, also, it doesn't actually call, so there's no ceasefire in this agreement whatsoever. Um, here's Adele, uh, Adil Hack. This is a professor at Rutgers Law, and he kind of summarizes what the deal is that Hamas is supposed to accept, that they're claiming it's just up to Hamas. It's, you know, they're the ones who don't like peace. He says this is not the deal Biden put forward on May 31st or the one endorsed by the Security Council in Res Resolution 2735. More sp Zooming in, more specifically, Hamas objects to the fact but the proposal doesn't include a permanent ceasefire or comprehensive Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. It would also not allow the free movement of civilians from southern Gaza to the north because it endorses Netanyahu's demand for control of the Netzarim corridor. The proposal would also give Israel control of the Rafah crossing and the Philadelphia corridor along the Egypt-Gaza border, as Netanyahu has demanded per the Hamas statement. So, why would Hamas accept a supposed ceasefire that is not a ceasefire and continues to allow Israel to control the Gaza Strip and the borders? Uh, that is not a, in particular, the fact that the, it's not a real ceasefire agreement, that it's just a pause, that Israel wants their hostages back. And as soon as they get their hostages back, they're going to pummel Gaza some more. They're going to continue pummeling them. And the worst part about it is that the order of events is that Antony Blinken went, met with the officials in Egypt and Qatar, uh, came up with a proposal, went to Netanyahu, and Hamas had agreed to the proposal at that point and said, okay, that sounds good. It was a, a real ceasefire agreement. Goes to Netanyahu, and Netanyahu says, no, I'm not going to accept this agreement. Um, we need to modify this. So then Blinken uh, basically does whatever Netanyahu wants and allows him to rewrite the agreement to where it is no longer really an agreement, it's just a pause, and the Israelis control everything. And then Blinken does this press, you know, uh, press conference where he says, oh, you know, it's up to Hamas now, they've got to accept this agreement. That's not really an agreement at all. That's instead been rewritten by the Israelis. It is not the original agreement that was put forward by Egypt or Qatar or what the Palestinians have said that they would agree to. It instead is just a way to prolong and a way to blame it on, on the Palestinians to say, well, it's the Palestinians' fault. We've tried to make peace numerous times. Um, they said they accepted it. We then accepted it. And so now they're not accept now Hamas is not accepting it. And they forget to tell you the detail that they rewrote it, which is why Hamas will no longer accept it. And it's not an actual ceasefire agreement, that they're allowed to just go back in and and uh bomb the place. So now let's talk about the Philadelphia Corridor, because this is the issue that has been a big, a, a real big sticking point in this. Now it's really more the ceasefire because Israel's not calling this a ceasefire. They're refusing a ceasefire, a real ceasefire. Uh, and so that's kind of the newest sticking point. But let's go ahead and look at the Philadelphia Corridor. This is uh, this has been the sticking point. Now, this is just it's just a fancy term for the border between Gaza and and uh Egypt. They call it the Philadelphia Corridor because, of course, Israel has its own border with Egypt. So rather than calling it the Gaza-Egypt border, they call it the Philadelphia Corridor because they don't want to recognize Gaza as its own sovereign entity, its own sovereign nation, of course. So Israel 
uh, renames it in order to avoid that. So this Philadelphia corridor is the issue. Israel wants to control the border between Gaza and Egypt. And right there, that should show you that Israel has no intention whatsoever of a two-state solution. Because what business would Israel have at that border crossing if Gaza is its own country and Egypt is its own country? Israel would have no business there. It's not their border. They could go and protect their own border, but that's not their border. The fact that they want indefinite control over that border shows they have no interest in a two-state solution at all. So they're wanting to control this. Egypt doesn't like that idea. Uh, and there's actually a lot of Israelis who don't like this idea either. Egypt doesn't want Israel at that border. They actually, back in January, when Israel was marching towards that border and saying that they were going to capture it, uh, that really pissed off Egypt and that put a, a strain on their relationship. Egypt doesn't want Israel at their border right there controlling it. Israel took control of it anyway. Uh, Egypt is at the behest of United States money and has had to pretty much just suck it up. That's ultimately what Egypt has had to do. Egypt has had to agree to everything because the United States dangles the, the carrot and the stick of money. It says, you want money or not? We got money for you, so you got to do what we say when it comes to Israel. Oh, you don't want to do, you want to stand up for the Palestinians? Well, then we're going to use the stick. We're going to take away all that money and we're going to make sure you feel a lot of pain, Egypt. So Egypt does whatever the United States and whatever, and then, you know, in turn, whatever Israel wants. So this border is, is the issue. Egypt has now said, all right, fine, we'll let the Israelis control it. Israel says, we want to control it because this is how they're smuggling in weapons. And we're not going to allow Hamas to smuggle in weapons into Gaza uh, through this corridor. Now, I understand that. But again, you put yourself in the middle of what you claim to be hostile territory all around. There's hostile nation. You're a little tiny nation, a little tiny democracy, and you're just surrounded by all this hate and all these hostile nations. You're still going to be surrounded by hostile nations. What do you do about all your other borders? Protect your border. Deal with it in that way. Do a better job. We all know that October 7th, you just it looks like you just allowed it to happen, that you weren't really actually trying even to protect your border. That if you really tried, you would have prevented it. You chose not to so that you could ultimately implement this plan. So um, they want to control that. Now, a lot of Israelis are super against this. Why? Because why would they want to stay in Gaza and continue to have to fight and, and be harmed by Hamas and Hamas's ability to rebuild their, their soldiers? They've recruited a ton of people since this war has broken out. And so these Israeli soldiers would be there, literal sitting ducks, trying to guard a border where they shouldn't be, and they're going to they're going to feel the pain. They're going to feel the pain. So a lot of them are advocating instead for some sort of kind of an over the horizon style guarding of the border. They want to use uh, a lot of technology, high tech, sophisticated, um, you know, in, in in order to protect the border from smuggling of some kind. So we'll see what they end up doing there. But that. Corridor has been a large sticking point. Now the sticking point is also the fact that Israel's not actually offering a ceasefire. They're just saying, give us our hostage. We'll stop bombing you, which, by the way, right now they've ramped up their bombing. They're on a massive bombing campaign. Uh, but they'll say, look, we'll, we'll slow it down. We'll stop it for a minute. But then we're going to start up again as soon as you give us the hostages back. No one's going to agree to that. They know Hamas is not going to agree to that. They're not expecting Hamas to actually agree to that. They want Hamas to reject it so that they could continue saying, see, see, it's the Palestinians' fault. They don't actually want peace. We're the good guys. And you you, you media and all you people out there, you're not paying it. You're, you're just anti-Semites. It's just what you are. So that's what they're asking for. And that's where we're at with these supposed ceasefire negotiations, which are not actually ceasefire negotiations um, at all. That is exactly what is happening here. So um, pretty insane what's going on there. Just absolutely insane. Another thing I wanted to point out was um, one of the reasons why we're also not getting to a ceasefire negotiation. It's not just the Israelis that are not really negotiating in good faith, but there's actually been the cradle reported on this. And this is just really shocking that there's actually an Egyptian businessman who's making $2 million a day off of the suffering of the Palestinian people who are trying to flee Gaza. And in fact, the claim is that this person is even somewhat involved in these ceasefire negotiations, meaning why would they want a ceasefire if they're making $2 million a day? So you've got these other forces at play here, always a money-making scheme 
off of suffering. We've seen this over and over with the military industrial complex making tons of money off of war. It's not just America that does it. It's Egypt as well. The cradle reports, Egypt and Israel have reached an agreement that would allow Israel to maintain control of the Egypt-Gaza border. Um, but they're also saying here that that there is, uh, let me just get to this point here. Middle Eastern Eye notes, Egypt may have agreed to Israel's terms for financial reasons. The Qatari-funded outlet reported that before Israel shut the crossing, a company owned by an Egyptian businessman close to the president, al-Sisi, was making around $2 million per day by charging Palestinians trying to escape the war. Palestinians were forced to pay uh, this consulting and tourism firm $5,000 per adult and $25,000 per child to cross the border into Egypt. So they got coyotes now, basically coyotes that are uh, shaking down these desperate Palestinians and saying, if you want to get into Egypt, you got to pay us 5,000. You got to pay 2,000 per kid, 5,000 per adult. And that's how we'll let you into Egypt. Um, they're making a ton of money off of this. So why would they want to negotiate any peace? They like the war to continue if they're making this kind of money. And that also answers a question, kind of. It doesn't really, but we'll just kind of, you know, we could kind of go down this path for those people that are kind of pea-brained. And they think that, you know, well, if the pro-Israel people that are saying, well, why doesn't Egypt just, if, if they were really cared, if they cared about these Palestinians, they would just open up their borders and let all the Palestinians go into Egypt, which, you know, is a pea brain idea because that, of course, is what Israel wants. They want, they, either it's a pea brain idea or the person's thinking they're clever and they're like, oh, I could trick you into, into saying, yeah, why doesn't Egypt just open up the gates and let all the Palestinians in? And then whoop, we got the land. We got the land. That's what we were wanting. We got it. We cleared them. We cleared it of all of those pesky Arabs. Uh, but this would answer that question too. You know, look, Egypt doesn't have a desire to open up the floodgates for a variety of reasons. They don't have to accept 2 million refugees, first of all. Secondly, uh, they don't need to. It's Israel that's causing the fact that there are refugees. So if Israel just stops bombing them, then they wouldn't need to be refugees at all. And their their home is not Egypt. Their home is Palestine. So that's where they should stay. And that's where they need to be. But also it could be that they're making a lot of money off of the fact that they can actually coyote, you know, operate as coyotes and smugglers and charge people a bunch of money to, to come into Egypt. And why would they want to end that money-making scheme as well? So there's a lot of reasons why Egypt, some of them for good reasons and some of them for bad reasons, why they would not want to open up the floodgates and allow all the Palestinians to go running into Egypt. Better idea. Why don't all the Israelis just go and run off to Egypt? Why does it have to be the Palestinians? You want someone to go into the Sinai Peninsula, go make your life there and see, see how that goes. <laughs> Why does it have to be the other group? You're the ones that just showed up. You go. Hey guys, this was just a clip of a longer show. Catch the full show by going to KimIversonShow.com. It is free. It airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. You could go back now and watch this full interview. I highly recommend it. Again, go to KimIversonShow.com. Thank you so much for watching.